I've been using Ubuntu 25.04 for a few months, along with the OpenSUSE beta, and after testing Linux Mint, I wanted to write individual reviews once the final versions are released, plus a comparative video between all these distributions and Debian. I recently upgraded to Snapshot 4 of Ubuntu 25.10, yes, because now Ubuntu betas are called Snapshots, and this sparked a few considerations. This isn't exactly a review. It's more a reflection on Ubuntu 25.10 and the trajectory that Canonical itself is taking. This version will be one of the most distinctive and important of recent years. It already brings many new features and some truly important and often questionable technical and design choices. I place first, in equal measure, the choice to adopt an unstable kernel in the release. A year ago, Ubuntu developers had announced that the distribution would release with the latest development kernel. In this case, for Ubuntu 25.10, Questing Quaka, it will be kernel 6.17 in release candidate, a kernel still unstable for a couple of weeks before reaching the final release. Another gem is the choice to replace sudo with a Rust-based version and the introduction of Rust libraries by default. The Rust 8.0lib package is described as part of the Hardware API project, owned and developed by the Canonical Hardware Certification Team. It will be used by Ubuntu Pro Client to retrieve information about the machine and check its certification status. But there will also be the possibility of advanced encryption. Ubuntu 25.10 will make it easier to use hardware-backed full-disk encryption integrated with a trusted platform module, strengthening the distribution's security story, though still only as an experimental feature. A new default terminal emulator will be introduced. It will replace GNOMES. Patixis is billed as a terminal for a container-oriented desktop, allowing users to easily save and access container setups with support for Podman, Toolbox, and Distrobox listed on its Flathub store page. It leverages the GTK4 VTE library with GPU acceleration, wrapped in a modern GTK4 Libid Weta interface, with all the advantages this brings, like accent color integration, keyboard shortcuts, and a slick zooming tab overview. Beyond that, it has a stack of additional features that will appeal to all kinds of terminal enthusiasts, not just those who routinely work with containers on the Linux desktop. Pin tabs and saved sessions, customizable color palettes, profiles with container integration, foreground process tracking like sudo and SSH, transparent terminal background support, configurable keyboard shortcuts, and a terminal inspector. Tabs also run within separate C groups for better resource management. It's interesting to note that the creator of Tixis, GNOME developer Christian Hergert, observes that his app is probably not the fastest thing out there, but close enough that other features have more value. The GNOME image viewer will also be replaced with Loop, a GNOME core app. It's a GPU-accelerated image viewer built in Rust and GTK4 Libed Weta, using Glycin for loading images and metadata, and it also offers basic editing like crop, rotate, and flip. Loop's minimal UI makes the image the prime focus, with on-canvas controls that let you page between images and zoom, touch-friendly with smooth animations on touchpad or touchscreen. I had the perception, using Ubuntu 25.04 and this series of betas, of facing a polished project, exceptionally packaged, but it delivers a user experience that is mediocre, banal, bland. Everything works so-so, everything is recognized, all software is there and installs, but performance is questionable and bugs are everywhere, not only in this version but also in the stable one. The technical choices all converge toward this vision. Replacing core components with Rust reveals a fundamental misunderstanding of system engineering principles. Replacing sudo, a component that has worked flawlessly for decades and has been scrutinized by thousands of developers, with sudo rs represents the antithesis of the Unix philosophy. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The paradox is evident. Rust was born to solve memory safety problems in contexts where performance and security are critical. Browsers and kernel space but applying it systematically to already mature userland components is engineering driven by hype rather than real risk analysis. The attack surface of sudo doesn't reside in its language characteristics, but in its configurations and the system's permission architecture. Canonical is committing the golden hammer error, 
Having rust as a new tool, every problem becomes a nail to be hammered. It's a form of cargo cult programming that confuses language modernity with architectural solidity. The adoption of a 6.17 RC kernel represents a violation of basic reliability principles. A release candidate kernel is, by definition, software and testing, with bugs not yet discovered and potential regressions. Releasing an enterprise distribution with an unstable kernel is like building a skyscraper on foundations not yet solid. From a systems theory perspective, this choice introduces instability right in the most critical component of the stack. It betrays a misunderstanding of the layered stability principle, where each system level should be more stable than the one above it, not the opposite. The modern hardware support argument is technically fallacious because critical drivers are backported to LTS kernels precisely to avoid this dilemma. Ubuntu is sacrificing systemic reliability for marketing appeal aimed at users who probably won't even realize the risks. SNAP represents the negation of modular Unix principles. While the Linux ecosystem has evolved toward increasingly granular and efficient packaging like Flatpak, AppImage, Nix, Canonical has chosen proprietary vertical integration. From a software architecture perspective, SNAP introduces redundant abstraction layers that worsen performance without offering real advantages over alternatives. Loop mounting hundreds of squash FS is an anti-pattern it wastes resources and degrades user experience. But the most pernicious aspect is lock-in. Snap is not just a package manager, it's a control system that centralizes software distribution in Canonical's hands. The technical equivalent of Microsoft's Windows Store strategy, masked as open source innovation. These three choices converge toward fragility, an unstable kernel that introduces regressions, rewritten core components that introduce new attack surfaces, and a packaging system that degrades performance and limits flexibility. From a reliability engineering perspective, Ubuntu 25.10 is a case study in how not to design a production operating system. It's the victory of marketing strategy over engineering competence, of branding over technical substance. The final result is an operating system that betrays the principles that made Linux superior. Stability, modularity, transparency, user control. Ubuntu is not evolving Linux. It's regressing it toward a proprietary model masked as innovation. I have the feeling that Ubuntu is different only in appearance. It has a beautiful GNOME customization that almost doesn't make it look like GNOME. It has Snap everywhere that refuses apt, but it's actually a Debian derivative with the Debian ecosystem encapsulated within a proprietary distribution stuffed with unique solutions that deviate from the rest of the Linux distribution ecosystem. The final result is massification, a prepackaged product crippled in all the main system components, slow, caged, often buggy. It's like taking a reliable Volkswagen, covering it with a flashy Ferrari body, replacing the engine with an untested experimental one, changing the fuel system to a proprietary one that only works at the company's gas stations, and then selling it as the car of the future. Ubuntu takes Debian's solidity, its true value, and hides it under layers of customizations that weigh it down and distort it. It's not evolution, it's regression masked as innovation. The paradox is clear. The more they try to make it different and special, the more they distance it from what actually works. It's the triumph of appearance over substance. It looks modern and attractive, but under the hood it's compromised, betraying Debian, on which it's based, and Linux, of which it claims to be the evolution. These innovations represent more than simple technical updates. Analyzing Canonical's choices, a commercial strategy emerges. Ubuntu wants to position itself as the reference Linux distribution for the modern enterprise market. The progressive marginalization of APT in favor of the Snap ecosystem is not accidental. It reflects a precise strategic vision. Canonical is building a business model similar to big tech companies, a controlled ecosystem that guarantees greater security, standardization, and predictable revenue through Ubuntu Pro and enterprise services. This centralization, although controversial in the open source community, responds to concrete enterprise needs, uniform deployments, 
simplified dependency management, guaranteed security, commercial support. It's the same logic that made iOS victorious over Android in the premium segment or Red Hat in the enterprise server market. The replacement of sudo with a Rust-based version, as well as the adoption of components written in Rust, Loop, and hardware certification tools, signals a generational change in development philosophy. Not just following trends, but responding to enterprise pressures, where cybersecurity has become a primary choice factor. Companies today pay considerable sums for security solutions, and a distribution that can boast intrinsically more secure components thanks to Rust, has a significant competitive advantage. It's a strategy similar to Microsoft rewriting critical Windows components in memory-safe languages. Ubuntu 25.10 represents Canonical's response to Red Hat's growing dominance in enterprise. While RHEL focuses on stability and long-term support, Ubuntu chooses aggressive innovation and cutting edge as differentiators. It's a risky but potentially winning strategy in the cloud services and modern development market where innovation speed often prevails over traditional stability. Native container support with Tixis, TPM integration, a bleeding edge kernel, everything points to capturing the market segment of tech startups, fintech companies, and development teams that privilege modern functionality over ultra conservative stability. Canonical is transforming Ubuntu from a simple free Linux distribution to an integrated platform for modern computing. The model includes a free base to attract developers and small companies, value-added services like Ubuntu Pro, Landscape, enterprise support to monetize, a controlled ecosystem with Snap Store to guarantee recurring revenues, and hardware certifications for strategic partnerships with OEMs. Ubuntu no longer competes with Debian or Arch for the heart of traditional Linux users. It aims at the much broader market of companies that want to modernize their IT infrastructure without the costs and complexity of traditional enterprise solutions. It's the prosumer of the enterprise world, more sophisticated than Windows, less expensive than Red Hat. This trajectory involves significant risks. Alienating the traditional Linux community could deprive Ubuntu of its main competitive advantage bottom-up innovation, and community feedback. Moreover, direct competition with giants like Red Hat and Microsoft requires enormous resources and flawless execution capability. The trajectory of Ubuntu 25.10 reveals Canonical's ambition to become the apple of the Linux world, a curated, modern, secure ecosystem, but inevitably more closed and controlled. It's a commercially sensible strategy, but one that could definitively transform Ubuntu's historic identity as Linux for everyone. Ubuntu has become radical chic. It has that pretense of elitism. It claims to interpret universally the desire of users and communities, while often making choices that go against them, addressing the proprietary world, a strategy that masks commercial decisions behind innovation language. Ubuntu is popular, but how much does this benefit our ecosystem and our community? Millions of users will relate to a crippled Linux, avoiding the real Linux experience, and being deprived of more logical choices. Choices that, with equal cutting-edge innovations, compatibility, and availability, don't compromise reactivity, flexibility, or independence. This strategy creates a paradox. In the attempt to make Linux more accessible to the masses, Ubuntu risks distorting the very values that make Linux superior to proprietary alternatives. The polished user experience hides a rigid ecosystem, where user choice is replaced by Canonical's enlightened decisions. The beauty of the interface and attention to aesthetic details don't compensate for the structural limitations that emerge in daily use. It's the triumph of form over substance, of marketing appeal over open source philosophy. The question is no longer, is this the Linux we want, but is this the Linux the world really needs? And especially, in the process of conquering the mainstream, are we sacrificing Linux's very soul? Our ecosystem has superior projects, often cutting edge and targeted to specific users. I don't believe Ubuntu's approach is winning. There are genuine, elegant solutions in tune with user groups and companies. Nobara, NixOS, Popped OS with Cosmic, Fedora, OpenSUSE, and Debian, which is now accessible and solid enough to be the mainstream reference Linux distribution. Ubuntu no longer finds space here. 
It has become a solution in search of a problem that no longer exists.